Hello, the Rebel, and welcome back to Tia No, the last hits of Europe in which we're playing as the greatest nation on Earth, America, but the citizens' basic income experiment. There wasn't a whole lot of fanfare when President Kennedy signed the executive order, even less when the first 1,000 letters and the $200 checks inside were sent up by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to families in 13 states and 68 communities across the nation. The instructions on the letter were simple for the next year. You'll be receiving the same amount of money every month. There was no catch, no requirements, no stipulations to how you may spend this money, bills, clothes, housing, or just saving it. All was fine. And best of all, it would be tax-free. The most important thing was to keep track of what you did spend it on at the very end of the month. You would receive a phone call in an envelope with a short questionnaire to fit it in, to fill it in, to be mailed back. Soon the rumors began to spread that the government was just giving money to random people, which quickly began to work its way back through the political grapevine, and soon the citizens' basic income experiment was exposed via the Washington Post. The president has defended the program in a White House press conference, stating that the goal of the citizens' basic income was to provide a baseline guaranteeing income that would help the poorest Americans make ends meet, and that was just a year-long trial to see the results. The opposition has come from two sides, those in the Democrats and the far-right MPP, who would announce government handouts to random people, which would be incredibly expensive, especially in the light of all the other social security programs Bobby's been pushing, but there are some in the CNPP and the LNPP, as you say RFK hasn't gone far enough. He should be paying even more money to more people for longer. Facing this backlash, the president has to respond quickly, boost the payments to 250 a month, and let the test continue. Poverty will rapidly improve, you know, or get better. It will be too expensive to decentivize the need to work. Cancel it. Let's improve poverty as much as possible. We've got some comments to go through as well as we're doing Spectre of Hunger, and I will be finishing up that as well as um, doing the bitterest of the bitter. But this one's actually really nice. It improves their poverty even better, more political power, expenses rise. Poverty reforms will lead to moderate increase in quality of life, which would be very good. We get more support too. And right now we're going up by nine a month. Jesus Christ, with quarter to half percent uh, poverty. So we get down to 15 to 25 percent, that'd, that'd be very nice. But, a couple comments included. Well, you should do the new Waze mod. I've checked it out before. It's okay. Um, I might do it sometime. I'm not exactly sure, but maybe sometime. Um, someone says, to get more support in the first election, lose Guiana. I did lose Guiana. I did that originally. I wanted to make sure that we got enough support, so we lost it. But, it didn't work out so well for us. Testing the waters. New untried reforms have the inherent risk of failing and becoming sinkholes for taxpayer dollars. Policy planners may make predictions based on theory and advise accordingly, but a law's performance can be measured only after it is implemented, not before. Without caution to restrain the hastiness of politicians who pine for reforms, America will have seen a hundred good laws passed in a hundred days and a hundred failures that burn its treasury for little gain for this part. The President's keen to remind NPP congressmen and other constituents that lasting reform will come in due time. At the same time, he has authorized the cabinet to implement a backlog of policies at a small scale, as test programs of sorts. But then we can acquire much needed data on how well our reforms achieve their objectives without having extended or expended too much money on abject failures. And also, now we're at 11 because I went ahead and did this one, the fight against poverty. But no, just just saying right now, hopefully nothing bad happens, but, you know, Mr. Mr. Robert Kennedy here, he's straddling the balance between uh, leaders and supporters, so. Cause for a fat purse. Also, we can do this one because I didn't realize that we have to get this one too, so, my bad. Right to the workers. I mean, we could get a federal minimum wage. But the problem about minimum wage in TNO, what I don't like about it, is that it takes away the, the amount of factories you can build. Um, let's see, we have uh, low minimum wage, so, we can, so we're right here. So we went to, uh, went to this one, max factories and state goes down, so that's why I don't like it. And yeah, it helps poverty and industrial expertise, but like, I really don't like losing factories. But, here's for a fat purse. Once again, Democrat strongman Barry Goldwater is taken to the Senate floor to speak against her policies. This time, he railed against what he termed reckless spending by the president on welfare and education programs. After advocate, advocating for massive reduction in spending on government programs, Goldwater ended his tirade by quoting former President James Madison, the charities, no part of the legislative duty of the government, to thunder applause from the Democrat cronies and plenty of our own supposed party brothers in the MPP. He is, as usual, completely wrong, but has managed to trick plenty of our more easily led citizens into agreeing with him, and demanding reduced government spending, often in areas they directly benefit from. If Goldwater had his way, he'd cut welfare programs up like a Thanksgiving turkey, denying millions of Americans the essential aid they require to lift themselves out of poverty's clutches. It seems that he preferred government revenue to gather dust in a vault somewhere, but what would that be good of that? The purpose of tax Taxation is a funding of programs that benefit the taxpayer, and as the government of the, high, of the United States, it's their duty to ensure Americans have the highest quality of life possible. We cannot let vocal and influential reactionaries prevent us from achieving a brighter future for every American. This nation cannot be truly great until not a single child goes hungry. An America worth fighting for. That sounds very expensive. But, ooh, no child left behind. Hmm, do we like no child left behind? Hmm, George Bush. George Bush, why? Uh, the richest man in Babylon. Community action. 
We can try it. America's future fortunes are intertwined with that of its children's today. Their success is our country's success. Their failings are our country's failings. The strength and longevity of American society and American values rely on its pillars, and well-fed, well-taught, and well-adjusted children will surely become pillars of mighty stone. Our children's future foretells America's future. Therefore, it's the government's responsibility to create an environment in which they can all blossom to their fullest potential. As education reform is an integral component of the NPP's agenda, plans are being drawn for nationwide programs aimed at increasing both the children enrolled in our schools and the quality of education they receive. America should not leave its children behind, and President Kennedy pledges to make that boast a reality. Hopefully it goes well. Let's see, what do we have here? Um, okay, so, yeah, we have four, 45 center MPP, so we could talk with the Republicans. That's only 10 PP, that's actually pretty nice. But we already have, how, how much support is this? Add numbers. You can add Mr. Mocha Lover. Uh, 13 plus 45 is usually 58, right? Cool. Nice. Work with Republicans. Garner some far right support. Actually, uh, let's see, strength and focus. Oh, I forgot about this one in America. Like, yeah, this one's fine. Make sure Germany can't do anything. But we can also like suppress the Democrats and Republicans since we're an NPP senator. So, yeah, uh, the far right doesn't care about this. No room for compromise. The Democrats don't really like this either, and the Republicans are like, eh, eh. But ooh, we got mountain infantry. Look at that. Also, I did change up what I normally do. I I'm going down a certain route here. I always go down and do something very specific, such as. Uh, I always go air support, but since I've been using marines quite a bit more, I decided to go naval support. We get more defense, more cover rate, soft attack, organization. Since we're using marines quite a bit anyway, so I figured why not? You know, why not? Like the Pokemon. Actually, since we're here anyways, the U2 mission fails. Oh, we have the U2 mission too, so you read about that, please go right ahead. Uh, maybe we can check a deal with them. Cool. So, let's just save the game just in case. If it goes poorly, it usually goes pretty darn well for us, but now that I said that, it's probably going to go very poorly for us. But, we're going to escalate things. When in doubt, just escalate it all out. Thank you very much for maintenance companies. Oh, the Coast of the Illusions. Ah, if you wonder about this, please go right ahead. Nothing. A shrimp boat will not end the world, right? Right? Oh. All right, he comes home, see? No problem. If you wonder about that, please go right ahead. Welcome home, P Pilot Powers. Very nice. All right. Uh, community action. I kind of like one wonder that one. Oh, the Japanese ship leaves. Just another day at work. Look at that. If you're worried about that, please go right ahead. Nice. Successful implementing law requires the willful participation of local communities and their leading figures. Their importance to the lasting impact of the president's reforms cannot be understated. In fact, the result of his many programs suborns itself to the extent at which a community enforces them. Those who look favorably at President Kennedy's policies will not hesitate to follow both their letter and extent. Conversely, those who do not uh, will play every trick in the book to keep them from enforcing even the former. Securing their loyalties becomes easier when they voluntarily offer their own support for this outcome. President Kennedy intends to address their inhabitants, whether in person or through broadcast. His opponents raise comparisons to door-to-door -door salesmen, but if it works, then why bother complaining? Federal Student Aid, packs, uh, student aid Act passes. President RFK, surrounded by the students and teachers at Strong John Thompson Elementary School in D.C., just a few blocks away from the White House, is signing the Federal Student Aid Act to applause as new cam news cameras and photographers record the latest event for posterity. Today, we say that all of America's students deserve the chance to learn and grow to become the well-informed, smart, and intelligent doctors, teachers, artists, inventors, and leaders of tomorrow are in our school today. And we must do all we can today to make sure tomorrow is even better. <clears throat> The PSA, or the FSA Act, will set up a new baseline standard for primary and secondary schools in America in mathematics, English, history, science, civics, and more. The federal government will provide money to states and school boards that, due to financial reasons, are unable to raise their schools to the new standards in hiring teachers and expanding classrooms. To promote equality of education across the nation, other aspects of the law include funding for newer and safer school buses, penalties for school districts that fail to integrate their schools, and establishing a nonpartisan committee to standardize textbooks across the nation. While education groups and civil rights organizations are really pleased with the FSA and the equality and standardization edicts. Many states' rights and proponents are angry at the law, which is pretty much stripping the local control over education. That has long been one of the most important roles of the states, while most of the articles of the law are only for those school districts that require the funds and are opt-in. The need for money in many of the poorer states will force them to compromise on their beliefs in order to get the money they need to operate. Nevertheless, the FSA will soon make America one of the most best educated nations in the world. An apple for every teacher and chalkboard for every student. Well, I guess we'll have to see what the outcome is. As you never know, there's always unforeseen things that can hinder us. You never know. We have the best intentions, but sometimes things get really bad. Military austerity. We don't need the military for now. Please go. There you go. That's nice. I'll cut it down anyways. 145. Ain't too shabby. 
Uh, fight for the future? Why not? A day will come when all who are gathered here today will leave this earth for the pearly gates of paradise. Our bodies may turn to ash and our names may scatter to the winds, forgotten, but the actions that define our lives will leave an indefinable, an indelible mark on the ground we tread and the air we breathe. By such a time, our sons and daughters will inherit the world, which we have shaped into our own image. Can we, in good conscience, leave them with ruins that they can neither comprehend nor restore? This administration has endeavored to secure the future of, our of your children through making changes to our country's economic, social, and political structures. With affordable housing, your children will possess the greatest security civilization provides with affordable health care. Your children will possess a mighty bulwark against malaise and injury and with affordable education. Your children will possess the know-how not only to survive, but to prosper, stand on their own two feet long after you're gone, and calling on the community. The war against poverty, the fight for basic human rights and decency, is one that my administration has done its utmost to fight. We have pushed reforms and expansions of the welfare state to cover as many Americans as we can, help create a baseline, a safety net, to catch those that fall and need our help. However, this is not just a job of the government to facilitate. This is the work of the whole nation. Every one of us needs to pitch in to help the underprivileged and poor, the sick and broken, so that everyone can reach their full potential. For only them, when all Americans all 50 states, and every community, great and small, help their neighbors, families, and friends, can we finally defeat the disease and scourge of poverty that has plagued humanity for thousands of years. So, I call on all Americans from New York to San Fran, from Minneapolis to Houston, and all the points in between, your communities need you. Volunteer donations are needed for an innumerable number of organizations tackling everything from school lunches to adult literacy to homeless shelters. Donating your time or your money or both is a great way to tell your community, we will not leave you behind, we'll help you, we'll keep you warm, fed, and safe. The applause as Bob Kennedy finishing his speech is deafening as he waves the crowd and showing off his famous smile. Statistics already show that the poverty rate in America is decreasing with the boost of welfare, the support for medical services, and the improvement of labor rights. For the cherry on top, the National Progressive Party, which is famous for not agreeing on anything, somehow all has come together to support the president's work. All in all, a job well done. We will leave the nation a better place than we found it. This sounds like it's almost too positive. Force of duty, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can we uh, suppress the other parties? Political parties, yes? Hajj. Um, alright, well, I guess we can read about that. Hold on. Give us one second here. Nice, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, look, another division. Nice. Thank you. And, you know, let's just cut it out for now. That's fine. Cool. A white has no superiority over black, nor is black has any superiority over white except by piety and good action, the Prophet Muhammad. Enter in that all Muslims shall embark on a pilgrimage to Mecca once in a lifetime, and Malcolm X was no exception to that duty. Well, over the past few years, he's been rather occupied with other worldly matters, but recent events have finally enabled him to take a week off. There was much to be done, but the situation wasn't as desperate as before. The city was an everlasting tornado of different peoples, and a place where all the people came together as one to worship the great god above it all. Malcolm shares accommodation with a Bos Bosnian, slaughtered a lamb with a Turk, and attempted to explain his role in the civil rights movement to an Indonesian grandfather, and even though his monologue was barely intelligible due to his rather lack of grasp on Arabic, he did still feel like he bonded with him, or on a rather spiritual level. Was this what Hajj was really all about? Malcolm circled the cube and kissed the rock like he was supposed to, but the real purpose of Hajj was to embrace the Unmah and transcend the barriers that divide believers from each other. The real Hajj was the friends he made along the way. Maybe MLK had a point. If racial equality can be achieved in Mecca, it could be also surely achieved in America. In retrospective, the nation of Islam did seem like a rather impi impious and overly revanchist or revanchistic organization. Perhaps it was time to distance from it, to abandon the hate-filled clique in favor of the one true denomination, Sunni Islam. Some of his old brothers in faith might take grave offense of that, likening his revelation, uh, revelation to apostasy and treason. Who cares, though? Eventually, they'd also move past her heretic police, just like he did. Malcolm was sure of that. And stuff I'm not going to say, because I don't know how to pronounce that. Yeah, good luck. Do you know how to pronounce that? Great. I don't. Build a safety net. The reason I don't want to do this one um, is because it hurts our costs. <laughs> Unjust justice. I don't go down this way here. Just because political power would be nice. It's actually somewhat quick. You don't get more poverty here. You don't get better poverty. Oh, isn't there CoIntel Pro here too? Um, something like that, right? Integration, redlining. Do get more political power. National ethics. Uh, it's not bad. We could really use that. Even though, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm, no, we're going this way. We're going to go down this way. Economic Opportunity Act. With Congress convinced that the American people appease, there's no better time to hold the culmination of our work, money, and, t and time to a vote. The Economic Opportunity Bill is one of several proposals comprising what history will consider the most comprehensive piece of economic reform introduced to Capitol Hill since the New Deal era. From large school grants to nationwide vocational trainings, federal food charities and cheap houses, it's a panoply of measures both guaranteed and experimental with intent of tackling, hopefully reducing the specter of American poverty. I apologize for this, but I need to go ahead and do this right Real quick and choose this one. Thank you. 
The war on poverty may not even end in our generation, as, or our children's generation, or their children's, but we will sound its death knell with this bell's enshrinement. Announce to the world that its days are numbered at a hundred years or a thousand. The American people will celebrate a mission accomplished. Take pride for having laid the foundations of their triumph. Nice. And that's not too bad right now, so. You know, I was thinking earlier, like, I know when Toolbox 3 comes out someday, or it, it probably won't ever come out, honestly, but, like, if it does, I would love to see, like, a dead clock. Like, how much debt are we racking up? Can we actually take on loans to help pay off debts or pay off things? Like, that'd be really cool to throw in. I think that'd be really a really good addition for uh, TNO. But, who am I? Especially, like, simulating, like, we have, you know, the oil crisis eventually, but, like, still. Can we have some something like that, like, recessions and stuff that really impacts like voters and stuff like that too i think it'd be, i think it'd be kind of cool honestly the richest men in babylon 100 million tv screens the face of the president of the u.s flickered into being he sat in the oval office back to the presidential seals looking into the lens with a sharp breath he began my fellow americans i come to you today to share with you my vision for america on my travels across this great nation the world's richest i've also seen into the best of poverty that so many of our brothers and sisters are born into and die in a miasma of depression from which there is no escape even for the willing who are not provided the tools and resources to better their lives it is a fallacy often too espoused by callous and uncaring that people who are in poverty choose to be there are rightfully deprived of the means to, to their pursuit of happiness due to the color, class, or faith. When any American denies to extend a helping hand to his fellow citizen, he denies America. Some are happy to turn their heads or to snatch crumbs out of their mouths of the hungry, but I will not stand idly by while American children starve, while American women die in childbirth, while American workers are paid too little to support their families. We're better than that. We have the means to lift every American out of the depths of poverty, and I intend to make that beautiful dream a reality in the coming years. My administration will dedicate itself to the creation of innovative new agencies and programs to provide much-needed welfare to impoverished Americans nationwide. We should not rest until every American is provided the means of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, those three unalienable rights that have been denied to all by many. Thank you, and God bless the United States of America. In his darkened mansion, a man watched the President's address as Kennedy finished. His wrinkled liver spotted hand lethargically reached for the receiver of the pristine white telephone sitting beside him. He dialed the long familiar number and listened to the uh, dial tone. When it finally connected, he said in a scratchy smoker's voice, We gotta do something about this guy. Uh-oh! Uh, campaign where we haven't. I, I do want... It's only North Carolina, Arkansas. You're probably not gonna get the center guys there. Um, academic base and industrial expertise. So right now, academic base is slowly going up. Have we done expertise? It's still going up as well. That's actually not too bad. Um, I kind of just want to do poverty, but we'll campaign where we haven't. So we get some more stability, which is okay, but whatever. Um, I do want to get more popularity for the center, maybe. Actually, right now, what, 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 North Carolina and Arkansas, it's mixed. We have a far right over there, and Arkansas has a far right. So uh, we're probably not going to get the far right, even if we do this. Uh, I like that, but more liberal. We get 5% more stability here. Academic base is probably better, honestly, but... But I want to do this one because we get more support from unions and his radical support base, which will help us when we go to Harrington, so... Fight for workers, why not? Struggling, struggling. Uh, see, the president is an enemy of the American way of life. Ooh, champion of social justice. So we'll see where we end up. Actually, uh, voting. We have 54. Barely any Democrats, barely any far right, barely a few Republicans, too, so... Look at that. Look how much it would cost. 100 PP, that's so much. Oh, we can't do so economics, uh, social security stuff. Ah! National healthcare system. Cool. Not bad. Not bad. Alright, and then I guess we'll do maintenance stuff? Sure, why not? Alright, not bad. You can grab all that stuff, doesn't really matter to me. And then we'll do a build a safety net. And then it's a healthy society. And its members are free to pursue their own paths towards self-fulfillment without their dues becoming too great a burden to bear. Anyone can become whoever they wish to be, provided they work in earnest for it. In contrast, a sickly society leaves little room for free expression and social mobility. Everyone has a place in appropriate standing whether they like it or not. In America, that place is dictated by man's dollar, little, earn too little, and they cannot dedicate themselves to anything but making enough to get by. It stifles the faculties and puts undue stress onto the working man, but more importantly, it often foments dissent, which simmers into a violent caldera breaking boil. This can be prevented with a robust network of benefits and pensions which can, they can rely on to make men's eat, or make ends meet. Although President Kennedy had already promised such, whether or not he can back rhetoric with actions in the face of bipartisan backlash remains to be seen. The higher calling. Alfred Lincoln was used to the coal, but never the hunger. 
As the wind rushed in from Lake Michigan at the soup kitchen on Lake Paulina Street, chilling him to his bones, he cupped the bowl delicately as he turned into the shelter, not wanting to waste a single drop before he could guzzle it down. He didn't really make eye contact with the young woman who had handed him the bowl. She was younger than the usual crowd manning the soup line, who would sometimes look at Alfred with a mixture of disdain and self-importance. Charity, they called it, and while Alfred was grateful to have a square meal a day on the freezing streets, he'd prefer it if it didn't come with a side of pitying condensation. Or con... condition. Condensation. Condensation. Condensation's the wrong word, but whatever. He forgot this. He tug on his elbow, brought Alfred back to his senses as the young woman pull, from the line pulled a bundle of crackers, apple, and a few statutes of powders stamped with vitamin supplements, American Economic Opportunity Commission, on the side for the soup. You won't catch a cold or the flu with that. Thanks, Alfred grunted, uh, pointedly refusing to pick up the vitamins. Don't you have things to be doing? The lady blinked, but never broke eye contact with Alfred before replying. This is the right thing to do. Condescension. Condescension. My goodness, I cannot pronounce. My apologies. Oh, my words. Oh my goodness. Well, 145 billion in debt, not too bad. Oh, bye bye, Pooey. You did the best you could. God, 13. That is. That is not bad. Come on, we gotta go faster and harder than this. When in doubt, faster and harder. Hmm. Anyways, signal companies are very, very nice. It is almost 68. Not quite there yet, though. Let's get some of that. More range for us, shall we? We shall. They already trained those guys? Somewhat. They can still be trained, though. Not bad, though. Really not bad. Even the professional army's going up, too. Hmm. This went up by one more percent. Interesting. Military austerity? Okay, goodbye. Keep cutting, 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 cutting. Build a safety net, my boys and girls. The bitter so the bitter. If you want to read about that again, please go right ahead. So now it's... What? How bad is it? Oh, that's bad. Oh, I didn't want to do that one. Oh, my goodness. The dance partner. Oh, if you want to read this, please go ahead. I've read this like two or three times already, so. Wait, Angola. Wait, you get your independence again? Okay, well, whatever. As long as South Africa's still here. That's what matters. And yeah, Italy's with us, too. It looks like Switzerland's like independent in their own faction, but they're not. We have so many members in the OFN. I love it. It's great. This is so painful. But hopefully, once we get up to 15 to 25 percent, that'd be better. So, I rose by any other name. Since Kennedy's Great American Tour, we have made many strides in increasing the appeal of our reforms in the U.S. Every day that passes is another day where we make our case for the American people, where the MPP's ranks, and particularly the party center ranks, grow in number. But the good that we have done here must not be constrained to our borders. As the free world's greatest champion, it's our responsibility to cultivate support of our newfound freedoms overseas. With that in mind, the Kennedy administration has established a think tank for individuals who share its will to spread the freedom of and by and for the people, but not but not its means. They work for our, with our neighbors and our member states of the OFM, drafting policies that both align with the country's priorities and further their own people's inalienable rights. And due time, America will spirit a new breath of freedom for a world filled with tyrants and roses international as its spear tip for this noble endeavor. And we're done with the land auction. Inside the Third Reich. Oh, if you want to know about that, please go ahead. A fascinating read. An ad in the Rust Belt. There's been a single constant in our nation's history. The working men and women will always be there to forge new trails, dig out our resources, establish new farms, turn iron into steel, and build our new greatest landmarks and the strongest economy in the world. Isn't it time that they should be rewarded? The new social security system will help all workers across the nation, ensuring that in the event of injury or ill health, if troubled times lie ahead, or if you reach 65 and you're ready to retire, that you will st still be helped and cared for with a pension and aid so that you can live a life of decency and honor to thank you for the hard work that you helped build our nation. I'm President Robert Kennedy and I approve of this message. Yeah, just wait until we have to raise the age for which people can draw on social security. It's coming. A demand from the Fuhrer? Um, if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. I've been, I'm sure I've read this one once, so. Cool. Wait, is this a comedy routine? This is going nowhere. We're not giving over spare, you ding-dong. Then you better not assassinate him. I don't want to have to spend money on trying to protect a certain former uh, Nazi. And I'm sweating over this stuff, man. If you're in loathing in L.A., if you wonder about that, please go ahead. Happy 1938, everybody. Hope you're having a great, great year. Um, anything over here? Oh, yeah. Repu no, we're not going to diminish Republicans, because Republicans are useful. Somewhat useful. In this mod. Not necessarily in real life, but at least in this mod. I'm going to keep boosting it up. Actually, if we don't boost it up, we don't get PP. Oh, that's so close. That is just... Ah. Ah. Oh. Mmm. 
we could get more political power that way. That's the only reason why we boost up civilian spending. Mm. It's better to have it just in case. Cut that one then. That's still not too bad though. How do we get 15, 16 billion right there? I, 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 we'll spend it. Don't get me wrong. We will spend that sucker, but still. And by spend it, I mean spend it on like debt. I rose by another name. Gibraltar down to down. Good job, guys. The rights of the worker. Oh, the death of hope. <gasps> oh. Oh. Now, this is something I've never read before. Now, RFK, please. Grief and horror struck the American people today upon hearing that President Robert F. Kennedy and Vice President Hubert Humphrey were both gunned down in cold blood outside the Ambassador Hotel in L.A. Further details are forthcoming, but the shooter appears to be Kurt Saxon, a militant member of the American Nazi Party with ties to the John Birch Society, the Minutemen, and the Church of Scientology. What is the John Birch Society? That sounds, that sounds familiar. As the pair exited the hotel, the survivalist terrorist opened fire from his car with a homemade machine gun. He was swiftly apprehended. In a shocking turn of events, the Speaker of the House declined the offer or the office of the presidency. The line of succession then fell into J. Strom Thurmond, president pro tempore of the Senate. He's presently en route to the White House in a guard of motorcade in order to be sworn in as their next president. Updates to follow. With Thurmond in charge, many are mourning not only the death of two beloved leaders, but of their progressive vision as well. Mr. Thurmond is a vocal opponent of civil rights and is considered one of the most extreme figures in the NPP's far right wing. It remains to be seen what impact his administration will have on this country, but the grief of the African American community and their allies is particularly heartfelt in the wake of this atrocity. We will provide more news as the story develops. So within, wait, so we had Nixon, we had JFK, and then we have, uh, Ken, you know, Robert Kennedy. The last two presidents, well, no, we had the McCormick presidency, so we have four presidents within the past five years, right? And two, well, two of them being assassinated. Bro, America's just not having a good time. The Kennedy curse has struck once more. Oh, ho, ho, oh, we lose so much pee, -pee. we lose so much pee, -pee man. Oh, stability, yes, whatever, but... Oh, God. I'd actually I've never seen Strom. What does he look like? Yeah, that's Strom. I guess that's Strom, yeah. Uh, okay, so with this one, I'm just going to save here. And you're going to see me save this, because I'm going to play Strom twice. I'm going to save him once where he, well, for this campaign, and one where he's just going to go off the rails. Thurmond. Cool. And I apologize for that, but... Okay, so we can still do stuff with Japan. I've never seen this tree before, so the greatest disaster. The unthinkable has happened. We have two presidents murdered right in a row. The U.S. was still reeling from the death of JFK, and now that his brother's also been shot in office, an effing disaster. Already, we're seeing riots dem demonstrations. The people's faith in the government has been seriously shaken. If we don't do something quick, this nation will quickly, quite literally tear itself apart. Fortunately, President Thurman has managed to parse through the chaos and taking control under strong leadership. This country will not only be saved, but will come out all the stronger. Operation success, inauguration of Strom, Strom Thurmond. America's uh, quilt. Uh, its presence stretching from one end of the continent to the other. Each patch is a cornfield, city, marketplace, a scrap of land bought in genocide and, and pain. It is a quote of stories, too, myths and legends, sagas, and lieu de memoir. In the past decade, too many stories have been added to the quilt. Bloodshed, scandal, hate, agony, grief, the collective nightmares of a nation, and and it's all its complexes have come true time and time again, and as a symbol, congressmen and women sit in the House chamber, clad in black, they all yet know another patch has been soon. Worse still, as a man newly sworn in as president, true to some of those gathered, he's a hero, but to many others, Str President Strom Thurmond is a sick joke of a phrase, and yet there he stands, balding head gleaming under the TV lights and sick with, slick with sweat. He doesn't speak about segregation or states' rights to the relief of the countless enemies that he's already made. He acknowledges his unelected status. He says all of the important shibboleths of unity and patriotism. He eulogizes Robert Kennedy. America's last or latest fallen prince. Without any knowledge of who Strom Thurmond is, a casual viewer might feel confident in this new president, but their anxieties and their anxieties might be soothed for the moment, but to those who know of him, this is a dark night of the soul without equal. Death has taken two icons of progressivism and left in their place an arc segregationist as a leader of the free world. This new is bloody patch in America's, well, will take a long time to heal. We'll keep living anyways. Hmm. Uh, Black, sorry. As her player swore and left the table, Beverly McCaffrey uh, raked in his chips like an autom autom automaton. Despite losing again and again, the poor dude kept getting more chips, pulling it all in Red 16. Though far from the most pathetic gambler she'd ever seen, for some reason she felt an overwhelming desire to tell him to cut his losses. As though her thoughts summoned him, Beverly felt the pit boss's gaze burning her back, idly waiting for the, the compulsive to return. Uh, Beverly glanced around the casino floor of the motley array of washouts, deadbeats, and perennial losers who spent their evenings wallowing in the empty opulence of the Golden Nugget. Only a half an hour more, she could clock out, collect her measly paycheck, and go home to spend a few minutes with her husband before she, he went to his night shift at the hospital. When she was a girl, she'd imagine herself doing something meaningful. Was this all there to life? Musing over this, Beverly found herself remembering a conversation she had the night before with Pat, one of the other co-creators. 
Furtively afraid of it, somehow getting back to the bosses, Pat had told her that the times were changing and President Kennedy was on the workers' side, that they didn't have to take the bosses' crap anymore. All they had to do was organize and form a union to get the fair treatment they deserved, and the president was on their side. Beverly had never thought of herself as any kind of radical, but she was sick of living under the boss's thumb, sick of never getting any time with her husband, sick of having to borrow money from her sister. She couldn't stay sunk in this quagmire. There's a better life waiting for her. She owed it to herself to seize it. When the compulsive returned, he put it all in red 16, resolving to speak with the Pat before she returned the shift. Uh, finish her shift. Beverly spun the wheel. Sorry, Black. What is life if not a gamble? HVA Operation Thwarted. The Reich Nachrichtendienst, translated as the Reich's intelligence service, has infiltrated our own country with their agents, thankfully. Due to our own counter and espionage efforts, we've managed to negate their efforts almost completely. This should give our own agents some experience in dealing with hostile elements, as well as showing us to us that perhaps a more closer eye should be kept on the Reich. Good, good, good credence, but a greater opportunity. No one is doubting that Robert's death is a natural tragedy. The people are mourning the loss of yet another Kennedy, despite his political leanings. There's no denying that RFK was a hero to the people. There is, however, good news. With the nation recovering, we now have the power to stem the poisonous tide of progressivism. We have to act now. We must tear out the progressive roots threatening to overrun our Garden of Eden. There's still time to set our nation upon the right path, despite this natural tragedy. We can pull uh, something good from the ashes. First of all, we are in need of a new VP. The Rose is international. President Robert Kennedy hasn't only been focusing on the welfare of his own nation's people and the fight against international fascism. It's important to strengthen your allies as well. To that end, his administration has pushed to create the Roses International, an international program to help fund anti-poverty efforts across the OFN. Funds and knowledge from America's own fight against poverty are to be made to Canada, Australia, and New Zealand to help the lowest of the those in their societies rise up with improved welfare, health, and education and more. Efforts are to be made, especially with the native peoples of their lands, the First Nations of Canada, the Aborigines in Australia, and the Maori in New Zealand, who have suffered from systematic racism, much like African Americans and Indians in the U.S. Overall, the programs have been well received, if a bit with grumbling by the Prime Ministers and MPs of our allies that they could have handled it. Thank you very much. But we can be proud of the fact that they're willing to help out not just the poor in our nation, but the poor around the world. Breads and roses, too. Strom Thurmond inaugurated as U.S. President. What year is it again? Nice. What do we have here? Um, let's see. Democrats, Republicans. They're still slightly useful, those darn Republicans. Slightly useful. Oh my goodness. Wait, what happened here? Why did the growth stop? Wait. We were 4.2%. Why did it drop 2.5%? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why did it drop? I know, you know, RFK died, but that doesn't mean the economy is going to die, is it? It's also an election year, but still. We still have Italy, too. Sh sowing the seeds. Console the people. Let's do that one first. It's an irrefutable fact that RFK was loved by the country. His name, ha he may have disrespected the South and tried to destroy a way of life, but the people loved him nonetheless. RFK's popularity can work to our benefit, however. If we wish or work to console the people and become America's shoulder to cry on, we may be able to capture a portion of his base. It's very important that we aren't seen celebrating RFK's death. No one likes a sore winner. With the people on our side, there will be little we can accomplish. If you're wondering about this, please go ahead. It's a long way to November. Oh. And we're... Ooh, matters of succession. Hello, Mr. Speaker, this is Thurman. As in, J. Thurman? I, look, I, I don't know if you've turned into the tube lately, but I have something important to... I have, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly why I'm calling you. You're next in line for the Oval Office in the wake of this tragedy, and I'd like to say as a colleague and a friend that you should reconsider accepting the offer. First of all, you're not my friend, you far-right F-word. Second, who are, who are you to tell? Tell? Hopefully, I'm not going to have to tell anyone anything, but... If you were to be sworn in, it would make my duties of public servant to inform the public of matters that would make the president unfit for the dignity of this. What are you trying to pull here? The American people deserve better than a man who does the right kind of unnatural, immoral, and disgusting acts which you commit in the motels on a regular basis. Motels you chucked into with an assumed name alongside some unsavory men. Motels with curtains you had conveniently forgotten to close where certain onlookers might have been inclined to, uh, take truly unsightly photographs. We do deserve better than such a man, don't you agree? I'll take that as a yes. Good call. I'm not the disgusting one here, Thurman. You are. The whole gosh darn country is going to learn that first hand as soon as you take office. Your country thanks you for making the right choice. Screw you, Thurman. Click. One day can change everything. Don't get caught in, in a hotel room. Well, at least it wasn't kids. Anyways, um, yeah, I saved here just because I'm, I don't know who's going to be the Republican and or RDs versus the NPP uh, people that are going to be polling here. So we're going to keep going with the NPP for now. We'll see what happens, of course, but... Uh, can I get more PP yet? No, I cannot. Okay. Alright, so... Ooh, this is gonna be... Mm -hmm. Likely, likely, likely. The Deep South. You know it was bad when the RDs are pulling very well in the Deep South. Jesus Christ. Um, Southwest. I think I'm doing, gonna do Great Lakes. Let's do Great Lakes first, and then maybe Great Plains. Two, two great areas. Great Lakes, Great Plains. Look at that PP, Jesus Christ, that's so bad. Oh my goodness. I mean, we're at 49%. That's really good. Party leader is Michael Harrington, but still. 
But still, Strom Thurmond. J poor George Wallace. Who already ousted. Oh, console the people, of course. Fake neutrality. Setting up the board, the first few days were a somber matter. As a nation mourned for the lost president, President Thurman found himself quickly meeting with the party upper crust to handle the formal matters of his succession. Meeting after meeting well, saw a terse discussion between himself and the wary remnants of Bobby's coalition, who saw him as a threat to everything the young candidate worked for. If he was to accomplish anything, Thurman realized these ideals would all have to go. First, he would need a VP to serve as his aide. A brief assessment of candidates would provide him the obvious answer. Maxwell Taylor, distinguished former Air Force Marshal, dignified military advisor to the U.S. government for at least a decade and, most crucially of all, notorious rover stamp, and yes man to whoever was in charge. Thurman saw two excellent qualities in Taylor. He was apolitical enough to avoid discussing Bobby's old clique and servile enough to do whatever the heck he wanted him to. Plus, his military background would not no doubt appeal to the Patriots. Ringling in the party to accept his choice would prove a lot easier than he expected. The men of Washington were so desperate for stability in such strange and shocking times that his choice was quickly approved and confirmed by all relevant committees. With the VP Taylor now at his side, ready to do whatever needed to be done to set America back on track, Thurman gazed with confidence towards the rest of the struggles to come. The king and queen are now in place, now for the rest. It's all the people, it's cement his legacy. A fake neutrality. While the country might be heartbroken over the death of RFK, we know the truth. He was, slowly but surely, leading the U.S. to ruin. If he had been able to continue, there's no telling the kind of damage he could have caused, despite how self-evident these truths might be. We have to manage this situation very, very carefully. And I apologize for this once again. It is what it is. In contrast, if we lead by example and show the sorrow of the loss of our president, we can garner the public support we need to start fixing the damage RFK caused. For now, we will cry with the nation, and the nation will start to move on with us. Yes, with us. <sighs> Console the people. A stellar campaign. Huzzah! Thurman addresses the nation. My fellow Americans, we today stand on a precipice. The assassination of our president and VP so soon after the f felling of another has quite reasonably shocked our nation to its core. And I assure you that I understand your uncertainty and fear into this difficult time. But now is not the time for petty bickering or ideological opportunism. Now is the time that all of us need to come together as Americans to restore our country to greatness. A greatness born of tried and true American tradition, justice, and dignity that may have, way, that may, way have wavered over the years, but now can be reborn anew. So let us put aside our scuffles and work united to move past this awful tragedy together. Today, President Thurman addressed a nation appeal for calm in the midst of continued anxiety over the assassination and consternation over his radical shift of the government. Though his speech failed to calm down his more vocal opponents, many polls suggest that his speech was met with approval by much of the general public. Some have come to see the president as a paternal figure attempting to steer America out of an impossible position and as more questionable actions are simply necessary measures to stabilize the country in a time when stability is most needed. We have America on our side. Oh, all is well. So when all is well, not well, so we can't do this. I was planning on doing this before the election, but whatever. Samantha's legacy. When RFK was inaugurated, it represented a great victory for the MPP. He managed to push our party to the next stage by becoming the first MPP president, despite our differences. We should submit his place in our party as an influential man that he was. Whoa, what is the Far East Soviet Republic doing? This will most likely be taken as a token gesture, monumental though it was. RFK's presidency ultimately divided a great nation. Much of our work will be towards reversing his disastrous decisions. Republicans are okay for now. Get some more PP, because we love PP, man. We are the big believers in infinite PP here. Infinite PP. Oh, we need this too. Cool. Uh, Green Plains. Thank you. My bad. When in doubt, PP comes out. Well, maybe not that. Maybe not that. Cool. Um, so in the seeds. Thurman has always been has been sworn in as president. And now holds the reins to our nation. However, what we still have is fundamentally Kennedy's government. Our administration still holds Kennedy's outlook on our governance. This is gonna have to change. The seeds of our takeover must be first planted, then carefully cultivated. By the time we're done, they won't even realize what has taken root. The best action now is to open contact with the different power brokers within the government. We have to secure their support and start to mobilize them for action. To make our nation great once again, we've got to act now. Gotta act right now. Oh, we could cut this down just a little bit more and we'd be good. We'd be golden. Because honestly, there's not a lot much else we can do here. Oh, I want to do it. I want to do it. I'm going to do it. We could do this and cut it more down. Oh. Still in the seeds, though. Or save our PP for Harrington. You never know if we might need it. So, a new cabinet. A wise man once said, no man is an island. Every great president has surrounded himself with a talented group of advisors. President Thurman is no exception. We'll need to elect a new cabinet. Not just anyone will do, of course. For a cabinet to be effective, it must be occupied by men of true character. Men who, upon seeing our vision, will work tirelessly to make it reality. Kennedy's progressive cabinet will be replaced with a group of like-minded individuals. These advisors will help us lead our nation to a brighter future and preparing a send-off. With a go-ahead given uh, to prepare for the President Kennedy's memorial, the proposals have been laid out before all relevant parties. Two primary concepts have been accepted as the likeliest candidates. And a way 
presidential approval before it be given the green light. The first proposal for a mon memo memorial monument to be built in his name. The exact specifics of the memorial yet to be determined. It could be a library, a statue like Lincoln's, props some modern art, but the costings have been out of set up by the party financiers. While expensive, it would hardly break the bank and be a lot more than suitable farewell to Bobby and his legacy. I know a proposal from some of the more starry-eyed members of Kenny's old clique has come forward, suggesting that a day be set aside as a national holiday in commemoration of his life and death. Though, Thurman's own circle of scoff is such a seemingly excessive and most certainly more expensive measure, a grand gesture of remembrance could easily be uh, exactly what we needed as a united country still reeling from Kennedy's death. Alternatively, the whole endeavor could just be forgotten about. That was before, the people may not appreciate that in the least. Monument would be more than enough. A new holiday couldn't hurt. This is a way. Scrap both proposals and forget it. A uh, new holiday couldn't hurt. I'll go that one. Go big, go home. Solid MPP campaign. Good job, everybody. Good job. Good job, guys. Good job. The party not yet has fallen. Stack the bench. Rally the legislatures. The center shall not hold. Unity above all. And memoriam once more. In their droves, Americans from all over came to the capital to pay their respects. Tens of thousands gathered after sundown at the National Mall for a candlelit vigil in memory of President Kennedy. Among them were the major figures of the center MPP, and some of the other factions, the families of Kennedy and the VP Humphrey, as well as many military figures, foreign dignitaries, and so many others who were simply ordinary people came to grieve and offer their condolences. Also amongst them, putting aside his plans and ambitions for one night, was President Thurman, walking amongst his people, talking to a few. President Thurman expressed his deepest sadness for the loss of Kennedy in spite of the many differences of opinion held between them, and spoke at length of the respect he had for the man in spite of everything. The conclusion of weeks of mourning and numbness for the people of America would see the dawn of a new day as the mourners returned to their homes. Many had, in spite of themselves, developed a newfound respect for President Thurman, who was so willing to offer genuine dignity to a fallen political rival. A heartfelt event, which should ease some tensions. Binding the party in this dangerous time for America, there can be no more room for discord and selfish bickering within our ranks. Our party must walk together in lockstep. I promise that under my leadership, this party will be more unified than it ever was before, and I will am and am willing to use all necessary measures to ensure our values, American values, are defended and enshrined forever. In a rousing speech delivered to the assembled MPP caucus, both President Thurman vowed to fight for the party against all struggles both without and within, denouncing the historically fractured nature of the MPP. He has declared that under his command, the party would move forward with one clear, decisive, and American agenda. His remarks were met with enthusiastic by acclaim by his fellow rat associates. From the good old sidelines, the Senate looked on with a steady, steadily growing dread. They knew not how far President Thurman might be willing to go to unite the party under one agenda, his agenda. Through their muted but polite applause, they looked to one another and wondered how long their dreams of a fair America could endure under the new leader. The MPP only answers to the El Presidente, in which right now we're doing a new cabinet still. So if you wonder, uh, well, actually, this one. Oh, polls are updated. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yep, new cabinet, just not anyone will do, of course. Cool, if you want to do that again, please go ahead. But, call up Russell. A salvation of America will require wide approval in the Senate. Unfortunately, though it might be, without the Senate support, we will be unable to make any of the changes necessary, or necessary changes. Thurman wants to sell the keys to the Senate in his position of President Pro Tempore, after his ascension to the presidency. Richard Russell has taken upon himself that mantle. We should take the opportunity to inform Russell of all the necessary changes that will ensure the prosperity of America. Canada's got a liberal victory? Liberalism, the philosophy for our time? We'll see what happens. Choosing the bishop. Today, the ca time had finally come for President Thurman to choose his cabinet, naturally. This would no longer be a cabinet of idealists and supporters of government overreach like under President Kennedy, but as a group of committed, working to restore the dignity to the people of America. First on the agenda would be choosing a Secretary of State. Two candidates had distinguished themselves for the position. The first of these was Senator for Arkansas, J.W. Fulbright. Fulbright was an interesting individual. He was a committed segregationist. He held a wide range of stances on various issues from the cross the political spectrum and had seen eye to eye with the RDs in the other center on many occasions. While perhaps not the most effective of choices, his potential for compromise could quick help, quickly help smooth the other factions within the Senate and prove legitimacy for Thurman's new government. Second choice was Spiro Agnew, a capable and dedicated political operative. Agnew was more mild in his opinions on the segregation issue than Fulbright, but he could still prove a viable asset on account of his commitment and dedication to the American government. He was what some would call loyal and others would call a yes-man, but regardless of perspective, was assured that he would follow President Thurman's decree to the latter. Both men would be beneficial to Thurman in different ways, but only one could fill the role of Secretary of State, and by the day's end, Thurman had made his decision. Spir uh... Spiro, Agnew, Fulbright's the way to go. Fulbright really is truly the way to go, but I think for this one, we've got other times to 
demolish the previous uh, person's legacy. So, Spiro is a duo. Which, I forget, which campaign had Spiro as well as a VP or in the cabinet or something like that? I forget which one, which person that was, so. Spiro, it is. The party not yet, has not yet fallen. From the beginning of the MPP's history, we have been told that our party was a mistake. Oh boy. When we formed in 47, we were laughed at, mocked. It was said that we were simply reactionaries that wouldn't last more than a single election. The RDs tried their best to paint us a party of radicals and fools. They feared what we represent. A threat to their establishment. They'd hoped to see all of us completely fail in our careers. The MPP consigned a footnote in history. They were wrong, and the MPP now sounds stronger than ever. We have spent the beginning of our governance mourning our lost president, preparing our administration. Now we're finally ready to go on the attack. The MPP will stand the test of time. We will ensure its dominance for decades to come. We will be in the courts, in the house, and enough everywhere. If you wonder about snapshots from Stonewall, please go ahead. Life thrives in its changes of places. Hey, still like a campaign, but choosing the night. Next on the agenda was to select the Secretary of Defense. Once more, two candidates have been shortlisted for the position, or the final decision left up to the President's decree. Robert Byrd of West Virginia and Pedigree is a proponent of strengthening and streamlining national security by providing extra funding to the Pentagon and the security services while simultaneously trimming the fat and stripping out antiquated and unnecessary programs. Given the tensions that would undoubtedly arise from the more troublesome areas of society as a result of Thurman's plans, a greater focus on security would not be remiss. Alternatively, there was Mendel Rivers. A representative of South Carolina since the war. Rivers is the epitome of the NPP hawk. His fervent support of American military escalation in South Africa and his repeated calls for direct action against Japan had earned him the nickname the Granddaddy of the Warhawks. A name he wore with great pride, his gung ho, guns blazing approach to foreign defense policy would be certainly an appeal to the NPP as a whole. Bird? I think we'll get Rivers. We're, we're trying to keep things normal here. We get more attack and speed. That's actually really cool. Aggressive fighter. But this guy's a compassionate gentleman. Compassion? Hmm. Extra services. Eh. Mm hmm. Cool. Body ain't falling yet, but choosing the castle. The final position needed to fill Thurman's new cabinet position was the Secretary of the Treasury. In the interest of providing a veneer of balance and a legitimacy, the two candidates for the position were both individuals divorced from the segregationist debate altogether, each with policies that could greatly appeal to the masses and calm the turmoil in the wake of Kennedy's death and Thurman's ascension. Wilbur Mills, one of the most powerful men in Congress, as chair of the Ways and Means Committee, is dedicated to the fight for Southern rights and supports opposition on taxes and the like, but in terms of a few social liberal leanings that could come to haunt us as we move forward with cementing power on the other hand, though. Mr. Russell B. Long is a man of strong political pedigree, the son of so-called... Kingfish, Huey Long, and himself an accomplished senator of Louisiana for many years. Long was a big proponent of government spending to improve the plight of the working poor, the elderly, and disabled. While not going so far as his father's more radical policies, Long fiercely believed that the plight of the less fortunate was a government's responsibility. While perhaps not the most economically viable option long term, he would only be necessary until the completion of Thurman's Crusade, and he would be providing a much needed buffer of support from those he represented. With this final selection, the cabinet will be complete. The cabinet dominated by those loyal, or at least useful, to Thurman's cause. Finally, the work could begin. Even though it's already June, so we don't have much time to work. Mills? Oh, that's not bad. Mixed economy. Long will appeal to the masses. Big spender. Nice. Um, I like both, but tends to have a few social liberal thoughts could come haunt us as we move forward. So many power. Um, big government spending. So that seems like what uh, Kennedy would have wanted, so... We'll go that way for now. And the devil from down in Georgia. Georgia. Georgia, Georgia, Georgia. Richard Russell Jr. was a longtime ally of President Thurman, presidential candidate of the old states' rights party back in 48, a passionate opponent of many of President Kennedy's reforms and now key play on Thurman's ambitions. In a phone call lasting a few hours, the two will discuss their stratagem for wrangling the government into accepting what they had planned by the end. Much had been laid out, but so much more remained to be done. The government's hurried acceptance of his VP pick had made Thurman realize the window of opportunity he had in. Russell advised him to take full advantage of it. While the MPP were still reeling from the assassination in the country remained numb. They were far more likely to accept his ambitions in the interest of regaining some legitimacy and normalcy. They would need to act fast, but the rewards for success would, of course, be tremendous. Thurman tasked Ross with the job of gathering their allied lawmakers together to get the necessary bills drafted, and quickly. When all was written up, they would take the floor and pass each and every one of them, one after the other, in a lightning round of politics. The party could be corralled to vote for them, and the RDs were split enough that a few bipartisan votes could also be earned for more conservative seats. The strategy is set, and soon it'll be time to play our hand. What do we have here? Oh, campaign. Dub. Um, Deep South. That's so bad. Great Plains looking really bad. No, no, not too bad. Actually, it's mostly Republicans and Democrats. So, we want to do the Great Plains. The Rockies ain't too bad either, but... Great Plains are the Rockies. 
Planes it up. Stack the bench, baby. The judicial system has been continually failing our country for the past few decades. Phony cases that should have died early are being held up and passing on to the higher courts. Brown v. Board, as a prime example, should have died in the first court it touched like the ridiculous trash it was. Even upon reaching uh, the highest court, any reasonable justice would have killed it in deliberation. This single case alone has put back the segregation movement by decades. If this ain't fixed, our movement will not be able to survive. The best cure for a destructive case like Brown v. Board is prevention. We can start assigning pro-segregationist judges immediately, cutting off the problem right as a source. With these changes, the Supreme Court will be able to start promoting the right values. Hopefully, if we do our job right, we won't see a similar case even reach the floor of the Supreme Court. But Brittany requests a fan membership. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. Let the members vote. Oh, the Italian Empire said yes. Belize has voted. Guyana. New Zealand. Australia. Canada. The skewer from the left. And we're going to say no. <laughs> it was to be expected, but it was no less frustrating. The day that President Thurman confirmed his new cabinet was a day that many supporters of the President Kennedy's reforms responded with abject disgust. Small protests broke out in more progressive-minded towns, nowhere near as explosive as those during the height of the civil rights violence, but present nonetheless. Decrying Thurman's hijacking of the NPP with race haters and sycophants, the many angry voices of these aligned against him were cycled through the news cycle, spreading slowly and insidiously. Many of the protesters looked to the remaining progressives within the NPP for reassurance, hoping that they might frustrate the president's plans. More worryingly, some began to speak up in support of the more extreme uh, factions within the left wing of the party, believing that only the radical proposals could expunge segregationist thought. From the nation for good. It seemed that Thurman's scheming had not just united his opponents against him, but also disillusioned them with the rest of the mainstream politics. Something would need to be done to take back control of the narrative, or else the dissent would only continue. Darn progressives. Darn it, darn it, darn it. Uh, there was another comment that I did, or I was, I was able to catch. Why don't I do any other areas? Because it doesn't matter. It literally doesn't even matter. Like, we can still do... I only choose... We have the same things here for Central America and South America. I choose South America much more, just because it's easy to click on. It's a little more difficult to click on South Central America, just slightly more. So, uh, we can do stuff down here, but it, it doesn't really matter. To train with Australian intelligence agencies, I mean, it's fine. I just choose not to do it, because there's really not much that happens down here. And all this stuff doesn't really mean too much. Since, there, since Japan is just not done. It's just not done yet. And the devs have kind of admitted them, themselves at the time of this recording. So, there's not really much to do in East Asia. Middle East, it's not done. Africa, after South Africa, is completely done. Yeah, we can do stuff with the stuff here, but, I mean, it's alright. Eh. Uh, uh, Savage spies and information to see who really rules England. We don't need to do that. All the stuff we don't really need to do, so. I guess we could do Russia, but I spend his money. I don't want to spend money. Shift party provide Bukharanists. With political aid, sure. We can do that one. So you guys, since someone asked, wait, yeah. Oh, that sucks for central or western Siberia. I, I kind I do want to. I wish, hope, I do hope he wins. I want to see Valerie Salvin. That'd be really cool if he actually won. Tukhachevsky's not easy to beat. He's probably gonna win. You know, I'm um, move things around, but still, stack the bench, my baby boys and girls. We gotta do the Lord's work, some might say. Just go ahead and grab this one. Uh, we want more max factories in the state. Um. Siberian Revolution, Central Siberian Revolutionary Council, which is over here. Uh, which is okay. The PRC, basically. Far Eastern Republic. Here, you know this stuff. There you go. There you go. Far Eastern Soviet Republic. There you go. And really, I. Oh! Oh boy. The RD primaries in 68. Oh my goodness. Oh, we'll get this one too. There you go. It's all come down to this. A few days in the International Amphitheater in Chicago, Illinois. The primaries are over, the delegates have been selected, and it's now time to see who will lead the RD party even to the 68 election. There are now only two viable candidates in the race that's seen many trying to win the keys to the White House. Arizona Senator and proud power brand conservative Barry Goldwater, or Ohio Governor famed astronaut John Glenn. For months, in debates on TV and radio, at rallies from coast to coast, and in living rooms owned over the dinner tables of everyday Americans, the battle between Barry and John is raged. Pins with their faces, and slogans like, In your heart, you know he's right, and Sword of New Hats with Glenn. Posters and newspapers as cardboard hats and all the memorabilia of a campaign seeking to win the chance to be the RD standard bearer. Both the claim that only they can end the anomaly that is an NPP's Strom Thurmond, who now sits at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the first non Republican or Democrat to hold the highest office in the land before the U.S. Civil War over 100 years ago. But before they can focus on the MPP, they had to get the nod of the convention. But as the night drags on, a ballot after ballot shows little movement between Goldwater and Glenn. Finally, one of the few favorite sons left on the ballot. Only there because some delegates hoped that against hope that uh, the chosen candidate could serve as a comp compromise candidate finally folded. So the last ballot, the result is clear. Compromise candidate? Who gives a crap about compromising? What? 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 No! Honestly, okay, so with this, I'll be honest here, like, 
I'm planning on doing a very gold water campaign, so this is actually really good. So we can do really, really well with Thurman, and by really, really well, I mean like screw everything up. Um, this is actually really good. We're going to click on very gold water anyways. This is 1% for authoritarian socialism, I thought. I don't think it said 3%, 1%, I thought. But that's actually really good, so actually, that's actually really good. We will be playing as a pop of gold water soon enough, but we'll get there, we'll get there. I promise. God, we need more civvies. Balls are up, up inundated. Cool, cool, cool. We're just building a lot of anti-air right now. What is this? Protect American... Uh, uh, uh. Republicans. Uh. Come on. How, how many more days do we have for this one? Because then we'll just do the Rockies next. Maybe. Deep South, maybe. I don't know. Where are we going? I don't know. Um, oh, time's... Pause. Okay. Uh, the Great Lakes. Great Lakes seem pretty good. Great Lakes Great Plains. Great Lakes Plains. Great Lakes Plains. Great Lakes Plains. Yeah, Great Lakes. Oh, the MPP progressive primaries. It's been a long and bruising primary session from the first votes in New Hampshire right up to the convention for the National Progressive Party. Held in Miami Beach, Florida, but the MPPs are in a precarious situation. God, that's got to be hot. July in Florida? The incredibly unpopular President Strom Thurmond, having only become president in the aftermath of the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, and then proceeded to dismantle his predecessor's entire legacy, which is fake news, has next to no chance to be nominated when a true term. Thurman's been sidelined from the beginning of the primaries, placing last in the New Hampshire primary in February with a dismal 0.5% of the vote. I'm being forced out, and in this chaos, two frontrunners have emerged leading the two most important wings of the party. In the center by firebrand Democratic Socialist writer and fixture, fixture of the party, Michael Harrington, and Margaret Chase Smith, Senator from Maine, who is now uh, leading the far-right MPP from the segregationist and anti-civil rights history to a broader, more business-friendly position, as well as the first woman to come so close to the nomination. While there have been other candidates, some have won delegates and votes across the country, it has become clear that only Harrington and Smith stand any chance of winning the convention and the nomination. Sounds like We Like Mock and MCS Repotis, along with the chance of MCS and Harrington, have filled rallies and meeting halls across America for months. Campaign buttons, signs, posters, hats, and many other soon-to-be collector's items are proudly worn and displayed to show who they think will be the leader of the MPP, to finally break the Republican-Democrat stranglehold in the White House. But it all comes down to the final ballot. After a long, grueling debate on the con convention floor and multiple attempts to pick a candidate, a man has come to the microphone of the Miami Beach Convention Center to announce the results of the vote. The winner is MCS. No. Michael Harrington. Well, it seems like <clears throat> the mod tries to give us as much choice as possible, but we all know sometimes thing ain't, things ain't so clean. Oh wait, that was 68. Why am I doing that one? Why did I say to do this one? Ah, I don't give a crap. It's already good enough. Keep going, boys. Keep going. You're doing a great job. Because we're running out of things that, like research and do here. You know what? Strom Thurmond says, Let's resume battleship development. Stack the bench. Stack that fat thing, baby. Good behavior they have not. Rally the legislatures. At this moment, we have an opportunity that may not come again, with RFK assassinated and just gone. The center elements of our party have been reeling, set in reeling. The divisions within the MPP must be put to an end. The center will continue to be pushed as we take further control of our party, you know. We need to get our state senators and representatives on the move to press our advantage. It's time to start the consolidation of power in our all seats of government. <clears throat> We must achieve dominance within our own party and show our citizens the true face of the MPP. The far right will sink its teeth in and never let go. Oh, there goes Thatcher. She's coming back. Oh, I forget who I said, so let's just do Great Lakes. And maybe do Deep South. And okay, uh, assassinated? Oh, that's not good. This is out of control. Um, If you want to read about this, please go right ahead. I I've heard it before. Oh, there we go. Poverty. That sucks. Yeah, that's really bad. Holy crap. Toaster Economist. Oh, thank goodness. Please tell me. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, my. Oh, we got Serbia in the OFN. Look at that. Checkmate, Germany. Oh my goodness, that is... Whole, how did Italy get all... I didn't even do anything here. We got all the Balkans in with us. It, except, of course, Greece, but... but Holy crap. That's really nice. And this is from a funeral. If you want to be with us, please go ahead someday. Unfortunate passing. Unfortunate. Mm, Germany. Uh, I'm going to my mind out. Screw it. Yeah, like I said earlier, I'd love to see, like... Like a deck clock. I'm sure we'll have it eventually, but, like... Hopefully, probably, because... God dang, the dads. They just take so long to get things out. I mean, there'll be a lot here. I, I'm, I'm really excited for Toolbox Theory, but we all know it's never coming out. Never. 22 out of 24. Is this fake news here? Something's... I guess we're going to go nuclear now, since we can't build civvies or something. Uh, nothing like a nuclear power plant in Louisiana. That sounds ridiculously hot. I'll be honest. Good job, guys. Good job. 
Oh, and there goes Margaret Thatcher. Okay then, Margaret. Don't kill him too hard. Rally the legislatures. Um, actually, necessary precautions. The stakes that President Thurman were too high to leave anything to risk as far as the law was concerned. In these difficult times, he needed judges who would see things from his point of view. Officially, this was within his power to make sure of, but the president, well, <laughs> that was the dangerous matter. Getting enough votes uh, for judges on the Supreme Court bench would require one of the two possibilities. Either enough seats were given up, or he'd make new seats and fill them. Bringing up seats would naturally require that those currently occupying those seats vacate them, and making sure they would be willing to retire so early would require some very underhanded tactics. Indeed. On the other hand, packing the court was an equally unscrupulous and far more overt measure that was certain to kick the American Orange's ass even harder. Yet at this point, it hardly mattered. He had, he had already come this far, and the restoration of American values was so close at hand. All it would take was shuffling a few chairs around either way. Here's some early retirements. If there aren't enough seats, we should make them. Ah, yes. Dictatorships. If you want to go to this one, please go ahead. My God, it's full of stars. I'm actually, you know what? Let's spend some pee-pee. Let's unite the party harder. Oh, we love it so hard. Because if it's not hard, is it really worth doing? Maybe. Because even the RDs are willing to put aside their differences. The MPP is basically doing the same thing. Bro. Bro. A calamitous campaign. Bro. Dudes. Guys. Come on. Balls are updated. Oh, shnikes. Well, at least the king rides are done. Yeah, well, like... I don't know. I'd like to see, like... Wasn't there like, some mass, like, massive rise in the like, 60s in our timeline? Like, what happened to Detroit was like terrible and stuff like that, but it was like across the nation too. I'd like to see more stuff like that too in TNO. Make it more alive, but the art of persuasion. After assigning a number of loyal agents to do some investigative work on some of the more troublesome or troublesome judges in the Supreme Court, Thurman's loyalists found some rather intriguing information hooked up or locked up in J. Edgar Hoover's secure files. Some illicit hobbies here, some sexual depravities there, ooh. One or two questionable financial transfers elsewhere, and a sizable black male folder had been constructed. Some of the cases were somewhat on the weaker side, but it would be easy to fill them with false accusations, with enough true scandals to build off of. The false ones could easily be legitimized. Now, all that was left to do was arrange meetings with the judges in question, simply out of concern for their health, of course. Perhaps it was about time they retired. After all, better get out of the limelight before they encounter any scandals. Let's just discuss your futures in private. <clears throat> The meetings were where the obstruction saw a rather mixed response. All were very clearly uncomfortable with the information leveled against them, and some were furious, but they are now very aware of the severity of their position. Two of the judges immediately caved in, insisted they would consider the suggestion of the president, and plan an early retirement. The other two, on the other hand, may prove to be a problem. A major problem. While they expressed a similar desire to consider their options, Chad was quick picked up by the agents after the meeting that while they intend to retreat from public life, they're mortified by what they see as a blatant corruption of blackmail Thurman government. While they made no rash plans just yet, there exists a very real possibility that they may swallow their pride and talk to the press about what lengths the president is willing to go to get his way. This predicament has the potential to spiral out of control very quickly. They better not talk. Uh, we're not going to be able to get all this done, so I might... Uh, might do some stuff here, maybe. I'll see what happens. Well, that looks really... I love... This is an awesome focus. We have done what must... What we must. The Eternal Majority. The Supreme Court alone can decide the fate of a great nation. It is a powerful tool that must be respected. For far too long, the Court has been on the side of our opposition, propping up their vile and illegal decrees. First, it was Brown v. Board. And now, the Court has failed to label the Civil Rights Act as unconstitutional. To ensure that this tool is never used against us again, it's imperative that the Court holds a conservative majority. With President Thurman in charge, we can begin to select a Supreme Court that will be making the right decisions. Unfortunately, justice is serving for life will make relying on the Court more difficult. We will have to create creative to put the right men in place. With the Supreme Court in hand, we can hopefully start to turn this nation away from the brink. Without a hitch. One after the other, judges announced their resignations quickly, simply, without emotion. The letters of resignation rolled in one after the other, and all were confirmed, of course, by noon. Within the day, all four judges withdrew to spend time with their families, and we would never involve themselves in a court of law again. As the day broke on Capitol Hill, the progressives watched in stunned disbelief as the details of the resignations were read aloud. Already, President Thurman had moved to replace the judges with four of his own candidates, already lined up and waiting to take their seats. The Supreme Court in one fell swoop had been transformed into a bastion of conservative law, and thanks to the comparably young age of the selected judges, it was likely to remain that way for a considerably long time. The increasingly uh, meek remnants of the center cried a foul, insisting some foul play was at hand. The left didn't even try to hold back, with one congressman having to be dragged from the hall outright accusing the president of treason. Their protestations fell on deaf ears, however. Indeed, though across the South and Southwest, many of the far right's loyal supporters openly celebrated the move, hailing a triumphant return to the good old days. The last dominoes began to fall. I thought we had a choice here. Six conservatives. We were at five and four earlier. Uh, questioning the dream. Oh boy. The poor man drives home from his daily grind at the auto factory. 
His next payday is weeks away, and he wonders if he'll be able to eat it all until then. He questions why he can barely afford the necessities while his rude, lazy supervisor owns a second car and a vacation home in Florida, com commiserating his lot in life. He turns on the radio. Another man speaks, his voice loud and commanding. He decries a shade of America that squeezes the worker dry while funneling his wealth towards the upper classes. He calls for the wealth that belongs to the people to return to the people. The poor man listens to his words intently all the way back home. A university student pours over her essay on American history, knowing that her professor will scold her for how unpatriotic it is. As a girl, she believes that her nation was the greatest in the world, but after reading what scarce few books she could find about the history of native genocide and the red skin and legitimacy of Jim Crow, she found it too hard to feel any sense of pride anymore. She spies a leaflet pinned to a corkboard on the wall. It advertises a student's activist group claiming to preach the real sordid history of America. After some musing, she also sets out to attend his first meeting. <clears throat> the black man had been politely turned away from some offices or laughed out or actively laughed out of others. Finally, he finds someone who will take him seriously. The white man greets him warmly and asks him about his previous experience. He talks about his days as a lawyer, primarily defending civil rights activists and the poor and downtrodden, and the officials listen to him patiently. After a lengthy interview, both are smiling. The left MPP is coming into the light, and a black lawyer and defender of civil rights is exactly the type of person they'd like to put on the ballot. Something's changing in America. The idea of the American dream no longer holds the luster it once did, and anger's beginning to mount. Decades of broken promises are finally catching up to this country. Unless something changes, the people may very well turn to ideas once considered anathema. The system begins to crack, and oh baby, let's crack this. Let's get, let's get to it. Come on, crack. Come on, crack. Come on, 2021. Let's crack this thing. Oh, oh, oh I mean, 1968. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Great Lakes again, maybe? Ah, planes. Why not? Good behavior. They have not. They turn a majority, I guess. Redrawing the maps. Our executive order will allow the states to gerrymander the. Okay, unity above all. Um, we'll do boom, boom, boom. I don't think we'll have enough time for this. Of course, then again, we have time until someone actually gets elected, so. And they have to take, it takes time for them to get into office, so. We should be okay. We should be okay. There you go, you can have that. Far Eastern, there you go. Provisionary Central Siberian Republic, huh? Cool. There you go, you can have some stuff. Strom Thurmond would definitely not be doing this. He would like, Russia? That exists? Ah, uh, where do we want to touch next? There's a lot of RDs, so... Holy crap. That's really bad for them. Um, Deep South. We'll probably do Deep South next. They probably won't do it very much for us, but we'll try it. Um, the Eternal Majority. And we're going to try and do the redrawn maps. Once our state legislatures have been rallied and are ready for action, we can start our work on cementing our power. There will be great changes that are going to be necessary for the vision we've, we have for our nation. Without wide support, it will be impossible to implement any of our changes into law. We cannot allow the loss of a little popularity to cause us to start losing seats. The majority must always lie with us. In order to keep our majority, we'll be required to start the restructuring of districts. It'll be a new creative endeavor. To start drawing our own new districts, states will be cut into many bizarre shapes in order to maintain our majority. We'll be able to call upon this majority at any time. We need to protect segregation and the conservative way of life. What does this one hold? Good behavior they have not. Huh. Uh, so, when I did this, uh, like, or uh, when I was looking this up, I thought with Thurman, you, uh, you had options here. Like, you could just, like, stay the course and be like, okay, we'll be a lame duck president. Or, you could just be like this and just, like, push your agenda as hard as you can. So, maybe it's changed since then. Like, sometimes, you know, things get updated and stuff, but still. Alright. Blue Seas Water. Modern Kentai Session. Global Fleet Distribution. The press gathered to hear the President's words, full expecting a statement on its stance towards the object of his disgust, the Civil Rights Act. And true to their predictions, he did speak on it, and President Thurman laid out how he was going to kill the act. It would not be a quick, clean death, but a messy one. His immediate mandate was not to revoke the Civil Rights Act, but instead he would be ordering the federal government to seize its enforcement. Any outstanding claims or protections made in its name would be dropped immediately, and the courts would no longer be allowed to invoke it in any rulings. In all but name only, the Civil Rights Act is no more. This is in New York City, before a huge crowd of supporters, the leader of the radical left, MPP Gus Hall, denounced with utter bitterness the takeover of the MPP in the name of bigotry and intolerance. Castigating the president in a half-hour-long rant, Hall demanded the immediate resignation of Thurman, and called for a new election, in which the people will certainly demonstrate their contempt for his despicable ploy to steal the future from them. Before him, the crowd roared with approval. Center-left and liberal voices joined together in one furious chorus. The government was against them all. They knew in a united front, while those willing to struggle for their rights would be needed to fight the good fight. God bless America. But we got more political power. Not bad. Yeah. I don't know. This is definitely not the way I envisioned it would go, so. Oh, guys, God. Oh, that rule pretending is nice and all. Uh, but come on, man. <sighs> Why? Why do you pain us so? There you go. You got stuff. 
Oh, oh, we would say what we what we send. Um, let's see, John. Well, let's see, Langley, Virginia. So we're deep within the labyrinth labyrinthic headquarters of the CIA mid-level office. Drunt named John was tasked with composing a detailed list of military equipment to be sent to a certain OFN friendly nation state in Russia, like any other CIA member. He conducted the task most diligently, laying out a number of possible options and contemplating the possible risks and benefits of each. The simplest and most obvious option would be basic infantry equipment, of course. The clear superiority of mass-produced modern equipment over whatever scraps local warlords can come up with would undoubtedly be a decisive factor in the upcoming conflicts, but Russia would, or, must already be overflowing with rifles and other sort of infantry equipment. Would that marginal improvement really be worth it? Another option would be sending a large quantity of motor vehicles. History proves that mobility is one of the most essential tools of warfare, with even Russia itself falling to counter the rapid advance of lightning fast, motorized forces. American vehicles could be spearheaded a rapid push to encircle large enemy formations, but could they also be misused in the front assaults against well-entrenched enemies? Could the Russian commanders be trusted to properly use these powerful tools? Lastly, John thought about going as far as to send them helicopters and jets. It'd be an incredibly risky move, but the potential payoff would be huge if they could figure out how to maintain fuel and pilot these machines. They'd be completely unstoppable in the skies for the foreseeable future. That if is a massive if, however. Even the slightest amount of carelessness or incompetence would rapidly turn these fine-tuned machines into useless pilot scrap, and John wasn't sure if that kind of expertise would still exist in the ways of Russia. It took a while crunching numbers and contemplating the strategic implications of the options, but eventually he came to a decision. The first delivery was to be dispatched in a few days, containing vast numbers of... Helicopters and old jets! Yes! Yes! Absolutely. Redrawing the maps, of course. Yes, call upon the majority at all times. That'd be great. Oh, I get this too. Don't want to forget about this. This is kind of important. Actually, we might actually already be down here. We'll see what happens. Southwest, maybe. Formation of the socket turn. Did I read this one? I think I did. Yeah, I did this one, yeah. Be able to call upon the majority at any time. A conservative way of life. If you if you want to reread this, then please go ahead if you really want to. Hey, more political power. Nice, nice, nice. At Folsom Prison. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. And let's see who's going to win the elections. I want to keep at least 40 standard NPP seats. Please, 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 please. That's all I'm asking for. Just 40. We have 45. But please, can we keep 40? For the love of God, can we keep 40? Anything else here? No. That sucks, man. Uh... Do we finish this? Oh, we did. Oh, there you go. Nice. Good. And flames. As he prepared to make his closing remarks, Thurman felt a strange peace wash over him. Amidst the thunderous applause of his faction, amidst the deafening silence of the center, amidst the condemnation of the Republican Democrats and the roaring chants of the protesters outside, all faded to silence as he began to speak. My fellow Americans, I have not been the president you expected. I may not have been the one you wanted, but I am proud to call myself the president of America Needham. Who did what was necessary to prevent radical elements from steering our nation on the path of certain social decay? He paused and the applause from his fellow man on the right drowned out all else. He briefly turned to the side and watching as every remaining center representative stood in unison and moved silently for the exit, pointlessly avoiding his gaze, to join the radicals outside, no doubt. We have taken all the necessary steps to ensure that political stability in this nation is maintained. But our nation is never led again, led astray by short-sighted idealism and ignorance. Our eternal majority over the South shall be the bulwark ensuring that the mistakes of the Kennedy presidency are never repeated. Hear me now. Segregation is an American tradition, and those who would seek to trample honored flag with the mixing of the races. And false equality shall never again rise to challenge it. Thurman's heart beat furiously as the right rose to salute and cheer him, but even now, at the cusp of his final victory, he felt a pang of unease, the chanting of the massive crowd yet outside yet echoed across Washington. It thundered across New York, Boston, and Charleston, it roared across Nashville, Birmingham, Jackson, and Atlanta, and L.A. and Baltimore and countless cities from the sea to shining sea. America was on fire. President Trump Thurman had achieved everything he had set out to do. Whether his victory would endure was more uncertain. Whether America would survive it unscathed was less certain. America has been restored, though. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. You know, I don't know. I thought, I thought, yeah, I've heard a lot of things about uh, Lincoln too, but President Lincoln. Elections? Oh boy, oh boy. The warning. Um, yeah, if you want to build this, please again, please go right ahead. So, all right. What, what happened? What happened? Oh God, oh God. Actually, let's take a look here. I never talked about this, but apparently the RDs got 94 electoral votes. The NPP got 4 to 40. That's not bad. I mean, it was definitely majority for the NPP here, but the RDs did get quite a few things here. Oh my God. What? We got 13 more center senators. Holy bad words. There goes the Republican Party. What? 50? You know you've done messed up when the NPP is not doing great in the South, but everywhere, almost everywhere else, and the literal country is doing... Jesus. 
They're not doing Jesus, but holy crap! Oh my! Holy shnikey fathers! Hey, George McGovern's still there. <laughs> Sorry, Barry Goldwater. Not this time. This is the best I've ever... I didn't even use Consequence for this one. Obviously, I used him early on to get, like, the first some support done, but... Holy bad words! Whoa! Whoa! 26 RDs. The Republican Party's dead now. More than a year of announcements, debates, and speeches and rallies come to an end on November 5th, 1968 with Election Day. Millions of Americans have lined up at school gymnasiums, libraries, and civil centers, and fire stations across the nation to fulfill their civic and democratic duty. This year marks the 46th quadrennial presidential election. There will also be 21 state gubernatorial elections to decide the state governors, 34 senate seats, and all 435 seats in this House of Representatives, and many other local and state elections for mayor, councilors, sheriffs, and judges all across the nation. However, the presidential election is what everyone is turning into the TV and radio to learn about as a poll are closed. As the night goes on, the votes are counted and reported. It soon becomes clear who will become uh, who will be sitting in the White House for the next four years. President-elect Harrington. Unity above all. Uh, all reasonable men know that the Civil Rights Act is a travesty against American sensibilities. It's a shame then that much of the MPP is not reasonable men. No matter the sacrifice, we have to ensure that our party remains unified. To repeal it immediately would be a blow to our unity. Many of the most adamant anti-segregationists would desert to the RDs in the most extreme case. It might just tear the MPP apart, unfortunately. The risk is too far, too high to bear. The Civil Rights Act will have to stand. The party must come first. It sounds like we should go with a center shot hall. But I'll do, I'm going to play this Thurman again sometimes. So we'll do this one. Letter from Arkhangelsk. The Red Army brings good tidings from Arkhangelsk. Since the restoration of our border in West Russia, we've recovered much of our strength, both in men and material. And with every day near the apex, we'd achieve under Grand Marshal Clement Voroshilov. For now, our guns are pointed eastward at the petty warlords and revisionists who dare solely the Union's old lands, but soon the old motherland's bulwarks shall return to its rightful places west. Be informed that the Red Army will gladly receive our country's military, economic, and diplomatic assistance once we resume the Great Patriotic War. You may receive other fur further communiques from us once matters within Russia are duly resolved. Signed, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, Grand Marshal of the West Russian Revolutionary Front. This could come in useful and handy. American recognizes it anyways. Oh, we'll do that one. That's fine. I don't care. Just, hey, look, Democrats. Bye, Democrats. I've never had this many senators in my life. And for the center, like this is what RFK could have used. When the Republicans and Democrats get elected in the South, I mean, Jesus. Wait, you have Lorene Wallace. What happened to George Wallace? Unity above all, I guess. Because I do want to do this one so we can have this many senators for the future. So, But I think we'll end this episode with uh, maybe good behavior. They have not. Or we have done what we must. It was never in doubt that Thurman's presidency would have had a distractor. Thurman's unorthodox path through the presidency has left many questioning his legitimacy. Some even dare to call the president a fascist, racist, and a villain. There are those who question our methods, accusing us of stacking the courts or a voter fraud or anything else those cowards could think of. We'll let them keep yelling. Keep throwing their insults. We were never going to win these hearts anyway. Our priorities secure a bright and righteous future for the U.S. We can rest easy knowing that we will always be remembered as a man that saved our nation. But hey, if you enjoyed this tumultuous campaign or video, leave a like, my friends. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow when we get a new man elected into the White House. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.